Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are locked in to a very, very special evening. My name is Swazi McCalley. I'm a radio presenter over at KISS. And tonight, I will be a hostess with the most desk because we have got a gorgeous panel ready to drop the gems when it comes to celebrating Black History Month here in the UK. This is platform it is by My Life, My Say. Um, and this is a brand new digital space called Quarantine Question Time. So we've got lots to be talking about. I'm letting you know from now. Get your snacks, get your drinks, Get everything that you need for the next two hours. And there's a Q&A session happening at the end. So get your questions ready. We want to hear from the young people who've locked in. And let us know where you're locking in from as well. We love to know where people have tuned in from. Um, so we're going to go live in about 30 seconds to one minute or so as people start to file in. This is My Life, My Say. It's quarantine question time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Swazi. I'm a radio presenter over at KISS, but tonight I will be your host for My Life, My Say's very, very special quarantine question time, bringing together some incredible voices and names when it talks about politics. Um, and so grab your drinks, grab your snacks. You're going to want to sit in and, and get this one under your belt. Get your questions in because the panel is looking 10-10. Um, I'm going to give another 30 seconds or so for young people to join um, and let us know in the comments, where are you dialing in from? Where are you locking in from? We love to know where you guys are watching us from. Cool, I'm gonna kick things off. Good evening, if you have just locked in, welcome to My Life, My Say's Quarantine Question Time. My name is Swazi and I'll be your host for this evening. And as stated before, today's Quarantine Question Time is a special commemoration of the black creatives, the black activists, policy makers, journalists, and everyday people contributing to our society. Black people have and continue to shape political discourse, both in the US and in the UK. Our Quarantine Question Time events are a new digital space for young people to receive expert advice. You can already see some of the names that I'm going to be talking to this evening. So expect expert advice on issues that impact young people. This event is a great importance to help educate, inform and encourage young people to gain a greater insight into the politics of black political activity in our country and across the world. Our event today marks a celebration in our calendar, celebrating and exploring the contributions made by Black people in the United Kingdom and in the United States. So make sure you hit us up on the socials, man. You do not want to miss any of this conversation. Follow us at My Life, My Say and be part of the conversation by using the hashtag Black History Month and also Quarantine Question Time because we want to collect all of your comments, all of the questions to throw into this conversation this evening. Before we kick things off tonight, I would like to invite my brother and one who is very dear to me, my Guyanese fellow, Mr. Jermaine Jackman, who wants to say a little bit about tonight's event and a few words about my life, my say. Over to you. Good afternoon, good evening from wherever <laughs> you're joining in the world. Hello and welcome to this amazing Black History Month event. I wanna echo what Swazi has already said and thank you all so much for coming. My name is Jermaine Jackman. I work for My Life, My Say. And we're a youth organization that amplifies young people's voices, empowers them to bring about social change, but most importantly, we engage young people in politics and its processes. And what better way than to bring about this amazing discussion here today with an amazing and fantastic lineup of panelists and speakers all centered around such an important topic in an important month, Black History Month, which I think should be every month of the year, uh, I might add. Uh, but coronavirus, COVID-19, as many of us already know, has shone a light on the inequalities that many Black people face around the world. Uh, but coronavirus is not the only pandemic infecting our society. What we saw in Minneapolis with the death of George Floyd bears similar fruit to what we saw on the streets of Hackney in London with the death of Rashan Charles with a chokehold. And all of these are symptoms of institutional and structural racism. The knee on the neck is a very symbolic one because it represents the black experience. It was the same knee on the neck that spurred on and introduced the rollout of the SUS laws and the over-policing of black communities here in England. And whether you agree with me or not, black people have had the knee of oppression on their necks for a very 
very long time from the moment that they are actually born. It was the same knee on the neck that saw the signs of no blacks, no dogs, no Irish in some of our restaurants and cafes here in England. It was the same knee on the neck that started the Windrush scandal and the deportations of black British people. It's the same knee on the neck where we see the disproportionalities in housing, in education, in our criminal justice system, in, ed in, in health. We had the leader of the opposition here talk about how black women in this country are five times more likely to die while giving birth than their white counterparts. So it's a very important discussion that we are having here today. And for me, it's about how do I turn my anger that I've been having for over the past couple of months following the death of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and turn that anger into activism? How do we keep our finger on the pulse and tap into the scale of activism and mobilization that we've never seen before around the world where people are talking about race and racism? How do we tap into that, that global fight for racial equality. I'm so excited for this conversation here tonight and I hope you are excited too. So once again, thank you so much, all of you from around the world, wherever you're joining, wherever you're locking on, thank you so much for joining in and joining in this conversation. Swazi, back over to you. Ah, uh, Jermaine, thank you so, so much. Um, and as Jermaine said, it, th this conversation, it blows my mind to think of the names who have joined this discussion right here. Um, currently, we're sitting on 123 young people who have locked in. Good evening. If you've just joined, welcome. My name is Swazi. You're locked in right now to My Life, My Say is Quarantine Question Time, Black History Month special. We're about to chop it up real soon. So let me introduce to you some of the speakers and these incredible, inspiring people who are going to be part of tonight's conversation we have of course the legendary civil rights leader reverend al sharpton who's going to be giving us his keynote speech very soon we've got rachel scott in the house white house correspondent from abc news very excited to hear from her marcia de cordova mp shadow secretary of state for women and equalities a huge shout to marcia i cannot wait to hear from you dawn butler mp for brent central so excited <laughs> she jumped on for literally five minutes and i was like i love you i just love you so yeah gonna have have some gems from Dawn coming in your way. Muthoni Kral from the National Political and Organizing Directory Democratic National Committee. I did it guys. I did the title. She's joining us this evening as well. UK barrister, the hugely inspirational Alexandra Wilson. And last but certainly not least, the legend himself, someone I greatly admire, Lord Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote. As if that wasn't enough. So you better get your questions in. There is a Q&A session happening towards the end of the evening. And if you've got questions, if you've got questions around um, inclusivity and diversity and how you see yourself in the political world, ask them, shoot your shot. These are the people that you need to be asking because the questions and the answer session is going to be fire flames. Um, tonight's event is all about the importance of diverse political representation and to learn more about the contributions Black people have made and continue to make in the UK and US. And before we start the q and I need to give you a rundown of tonight's format. So first of all, we have some keynote speeches. Woo! Get your drinks, get your snacks, man, for our speakers, Mr. Reverend Al Sharpton and R Rachel Scott from ABC News, who will share with us their projections of the US elections and why diverse political representation is so important in the political life and public life of so many people, including and probably especially Black people. Throughout the event, there are some key ways to get involved. I'm telling you, young people, we want to hear your voices. So at the bottom of your screens on Zoom, you can see some different functions, one of them being raise your hand. Throughout this event, you will have the opportunity to make your own comments and ask questions to the panelists. In order to conduct this in a fair way so everyone gets heard as well, you will have the opportunity to speak. All you need to do is indicate this by clicking the raise your hand function. I'll then call your name and you can shoot your shot. You can have your say, you can come on and ask your questions. If you don't wanna speak, that's absolutely fine. There's also a function called Q&A. So if you prefer not to speak and instead write your question down, you can type your question through the Q&A function on your screen and I will take that in and ask the panelist your question and direct it to whoever it is that you've asked it to. There's also a function called live polling. Um, and so we'll be practicing democracy really in action um, by giving everyone the chance to have their say this evening. This is super, super important, um, especially here at My Life, My Say, to amplify young voices and to make sure that young people are definitely heard. 
Um, without further ado, I'm going to see if the one and only Reverend Al Sharpton is ready to give his keynote speech. Um, I know we've scheduled him for 6.15, but in case he is there, I would love to know if he's there behind the screen, because Zoom will be catching me. Zoom will be there to say, no, not yet. And I'll be building suspense. <laughs> Okay, I think I've got five minutes or so, which is cool. If you've just joined, welcome to this day's uh, quarantine question time. My name is Swazi, I'll be your host for this evening. And this is a two hour conversation to celebrate black people who are holding positions of power and just political influence in our spheres right now. This is a very, very special quarantine question time to celebrate Black History Month here in the UK. And so let me give you your speakers again, if you've just joined. We've got the amazing and incredible legendary civil rights leader, Reverend Al Sharpton. We've got Rachel Scott, the White House correspondent from ABC News. Marsha de Cordova, MP, Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities. Dawn Butler, MP, someone, yes, 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 very excited, from Bent Central. Mithoni Kral from the National Political and Organising Directory Democratic National Committee. UK barrister, the hugely inspirational Alexandra Wilson, and the legend himself, Lord Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote. This is an event, especially for so many young people who have a voice and have a fire in their belly to say, yes, I want to get involved in politics, but maybe I can't see myself. Maybe I can't see myself in that position and therefore where do I go? Or maybe I don't even know where to start. What platform should I hit up? Well, My Life My Say is definitely one of those spaces. Here in lockdown, in a whole 2020, in this global pandemic, we've put together this platform, Quarantine Question Time, a brand new digital space for young people to receive expert advice on issues that impact young people. This event is of great importance to help educate, inform and encourage young people to gain a greater insight into the politics of black political activity in our country and across the world. Now, if you're looking at me thinking, how does this girl know how to host this? The truth is, I don't. I got into politics or got into the political conversation after volunteering for Grenfell. Grenfell happened, a, a, a tower block fire that broke my heart and broke the UK's heart, looking at something that should never have happened. And so here I am, looking like a 12-year-old with my messy bun and rucksack, and off I went down to West London. I'm in East London, and I met some incredible people and started my journey of activism. And where the name activist such is, it's just such a heavy title, isn't it? But the minute you start getting involved and surrounding yourself with the same people whose hearts burn to see change, um, it's an incredible journey so if you've just locked in welcome to this evening my life my say is quarantine question time celebrating black history month here in the uk we've got a huge night tonight we've got some keynote speeches and a live panel as well with questions and q a so get your questions ready um, and i think this evening in about two minutes or so i'm going to introduce to you someone who when i saw the flyer i nearly dropped I said, me, small me, Swazi, going to be speaking to someone who definitely inspires so many of us. Um, the Reverend himself, Reverend Al Sharpton, who's been busy in this season, of course, been busy in this season, um, but definitely someone who I'm sure has got gem after gem after gem. So I think before I bring in Reverend Al Sharpton, I'm just going to jump over to the legend Lord Simon Woolley. If you are there, Lord Simon Woolley, Hey, and he's on mute. <laughs> yes, Hello, sir. Yeah. How are you? I'm great. Listen, I am so excited to be with you, to be with you, Swazi. Congratulations on your award uh, of you. one of those young, dynamic activists that are changing our world uh, from Megan and Harry. Congratulations to you. Great to be with this panel. Some, uh, some of my nearest and dearest brothers and sisters punching hard fighting for our communities, and of course, the legend himself, Reverend Al Sharpton. I mean, he doesn't stop. <laughs> birthday last week, we wish him a happy birthday. Yes. Birthday last week, but you know, he, he gets stronger. He often looks younger as he gets <laughs> older because he cares. And I, I am honored to be with you today. Thank you so much, so much. I would really love to come back to you and really bring the conversation um, to the UK because I see the two of you as just people who I look up to and think, wow, everything that you guys have done. Um, now for us young ones coming through, you have set the example. Um, you see this, passing so the button. You know, this, <laughs> is a, this is a black button. I'm passing it to you for you to run. Take it, take it and run. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Lord Simon Woolley, we are definitely coming back to you. I wonder now if Reverend Al Sharpton is here with us this evening to join us for My Life, My Say's quarantine question time. Reverend Al Sharpton, are you there? Maybe if we sing happy birthday to him, then he'll come. Should we? Yeah. I am down. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit of a backstory then, um, uh, Lord Simon. When did you guys first meet? Well, it was over 20 years ago, um, wow. doing voter registration in London. And I called, up his, I called his office up and I said, would you come to London to help me change our world? He said, I'll be there. I'll be there in a heartbeat. And uh, Reverend Shotton came with a huge entourage of activists mm -hmm. and campaigners. And we just blew the city away. We went to schools and colleges and community centers. He gave a speech to about 2000 people. He yeah. was on fire. And every time he comes to London, we host him and we do great things. When I go to the USA, by the way, when we can fly again, Swazi and Meti, we're taking you to the Congressional Black Caucus. Yes, please. Is every, is every September in Washington, D.C., 10,000 African-Americans congregate to be together, to be unified. Mm. Taking Dawn, I'm not sure where the Dawn's been. She's been invited every, every year, but she's often busy. But, you know, we need to take our own activist, Marsha de Cordova needs to go too because the unity of African-Americans and Black Britons has never been stronger. You know, when the Black Lives Matter movement exploded after the brutality of uh, George Floyd's uh, death, Black Britons felt it and we rose. Yeah. And we took on the system. That's why the statues come down. Mm. Uh, British society was convulsed to listen to us. That's the unity. That's the unity of the global di black diaspora, African diaspora. Yeah. And this is one of the questions that I wanted to, to shoot over to Reverend Al Sharpton, but just to ask you as well, yeah. um, what do you think this time round for 2020, in all of your years, your richness and your experience, fighting for justice in 2020, does it feel different? Does it feel similar to a year that's gone past? What's your, what's your vibe? Does, what's your experience? Of course, it does feel different, actually. I mean, I think that we've seen the, the longest protest, the longest civil rights protest in this country ever with the Black Lives uh, Movement. And I think what it's done is, is that when we, saw, when we saw that young man die in front of our eyes, mm -hmm. a lot of devastating and racial impact of COVID-19 on Black communities, many white people begun to see life through a Black lens. Yeah. And they said, something is profoundly wrong. You know, the, the couple, the Olympic couple that were dragged out of the car with a three month old baby, mm -hmm. that into a white couple. Yeah. A, a, smart, a smart couple with a three month old baby being a whisker away from police violence could not happen to a white couple. So people said something is profoundly wrong and we need change. Now, mm. at the moment we're having the conversation, but as far as I see it, Swazi, we're still only at go. You know, before and we were at minus 10 or minus 20 in the conversation. <laughs> now, we're at, now we're at least at go. And we have got to drive our coach and horses through this agenda for justice. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing about this. In our country, you know, I mean, you work for Kiss FM and, and Medi2 with all your friends. The deluge of talent that you speak to on a daily basis. And because of the short-sighted, blinkered, racist baggage, that talent cannot begin to fulfill its potential. Yeah. So it's in society's interest to unleash this talent. So we all, you benefit, I benefit, we benefit. Why are we locking it out? Yeah. The challenge is, is to be strong, to be political, to make demands. But in that struggle, Swazi, everybody benefits. Everybody benefits when they listen to you because you know, you're know you a campaigner with a big smile. You're, you, you mobilize people, you give them a voice. That's why you won that award. Yeah. In our generation, a young generation, look now I'm gray, we're getting a bit grayer. We've got to hand it over to a younger generation who can speak to that generation, yank them off the Xbox for a while. <laughs> Get them into politics. My son's on Xbox right now. I, I'll be saying, son, do your homework. And he'd be, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's that young generation that we we have got to we have got to inspire. 
Yeah. Well, wants. we're walking in your footsteps. We are absolutely walking through your example as well. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Lord Simon Willie. I really, really just, yeah, love every time that you share. It is so encouraging. Um, I'm going to come back to you. And whilst Reverend Al Sharpton is busy on radio, can you believe I'm on radio, but he's also <laughs> smashing it right now on radio. So we're going to come back to him. But before we do, I would love to throw it over to Rachel Scott a White House correspondent for ABC News. This is huge. Thank you so much for your time. Rachel, how are you? She's oh, I need you on mute. Sorry. Yes. I'm so happy to be here with all of you guys. So excited. We're excited. Believe you me, we are excited. Um, I suppose, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a White House correspondent for ABC News. I'm actually in Utah right now. This is not my apartment, full <laughs> disclosure. I don't know if you guys like the decor. It's definitely hotel decor, not my choice, of course. But um, I'm here in Utah, where the vice presidential debate was just last night. So we're fresh off of that. Senator Kamala Harris, who could make history as the first Black woman, first woman of Asian descent, uh, to be vice president in the 2020 election. She could make history there. She was on that stage last night, facing off against Vice President Mike Pence. And we are very close to the election. We're now, you know, less than 30 days away, about four weeks away and so it has been a crazy wild ride especially this year that's amazing I love the buzz that you have brought especially given that you're there and zoom has allowed us to just jump into your world um, and so thank you for joining us this evening we are so so honored to have you on the call um, I suppose I'll just hand it over to you really we're so thankful for your keynote speech over to you yeah. Yeah, um, I will start and you know, I'm gonna keep it a little short here and just to save some time for questions. So if you guys have any questions in the chat box you wanna throw, uh, feel free to chime in and put those in or raise your hands after I'm, I'm done. But as I mentioned to you guys, I'm a White House correspondent for ABC News and I truly believe that right now there is no better time to be a journalist. Um, this year has been a year of racial reckoning across the United States and frankly across the world. Uh, we've seen statues topple, we've seen schools renamed. Uh, you know, we talked about a little bit in the intro, but that eight minutes and 46 seconds, right, that captivated not only America, but captivated the world, uh, that, the, that an officer had his knee on the neck of George Floyd, it did broadly represent what Black Americans and Black people across the world have felt for centuries. Um, here in the United States, it really was a boiling point. It was a boiling point for a new generation of activists from diverse backgrounds who have taken to the streets to demand for justice, to demand for equality. And one thing that I feel like I've really tried to underscore in my reporting is that their fight is so much larger than police brutality, that they are fighting for equality on all fronts. And that goes from disparities in the healthcare system to equal pay, to police reform, to fairness in housing. Um, and you know, I'm so excited that we're gonna have Reverend Al Sharpton on because he did organize that massive march on Washington that happened back in August. And nearly 60 years after thousands marched on Washington with Martin Luther King Jr. Thousands more returned to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and they were echoing that same call, that same fight. I was there that day. Um, I was watching. I was watching as people were taking to the streets, as people were marching, uh, people that marched, you know, hundreds of miles by foot just because they wanted to share and take part in the experience. You know, the difference, I think, now between now and then is that is. Oh, hold on, hold on. okay. See, this is what happens when you're in a hotel room. <laughs> that was housekeeping. Sorry. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. That's hilarious. Um, but but I will say, um, all interruptions aside, maybe they wanted to join in on the conversation. <laughs> that the the difference though between now and I think what happened when Martin Luther King marched on Washington is that. Uh, we are in an election year. Um, though we still may be fighting for the same civil rights, uh, this is a critical year. Uh, when we're talking about electing the next president of the United States or re-electing the current president, and Americans are gonna be voting. They're already voting right now. This idea that there is an election day, right? I think is something that we have created uh, sort of in, in the media um, throughout history. Americans are voting right now. They're heading to the polls. They're mailing in their ballot. They're making decisions right now. And there is a lot on the line this election day. Um, 
you know, right now, America is facing three different crises that are disproportionately affecting black and brown Americans. So to be black in America right now means to be dying disproportionately from the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, to be black in America right now means that you are three times more likely to be killed by police. And to be black in America right now means you are more likely to be suffering the effects of the economic downturn that we are experiencing right now in this country, in part caused by the pandemic. Uh, I think what the pandemic has really done is rip open and expose the disparities in our society in a way that makes uh, people and Americans activists on the streets uh, forcing our lawmakers to confront those disparities and force them to come up with plans and ways to address it. And as I've been on the streets and, and, and listening to those protesters um, and listening to activists and listening to average Americans, you know, it just doesn't stop with the president of the United States. Uh, there were activists on Capitol Hill where all of our other lawmakers are. There are people that are voting in their local elections and gubernatorial elections and Senate elections. Uh, this goes all the way up and down the ballot where people really do want to see change across the board. And so over the course of the last two presidential debates, you know, those crises, the economic crisis, the health crisis, the crisis on race relations, they really have been center stage at those, debate, the, those debates. And, you know, as I said, I'm here in Utah right now. I was inside of the room last night for a vice presidential debate. Uh, it was my first time covering a vice presidential debate. And it was- well, what was the vibe really like? I know it was very far from what I had expected um, because there was plexiglass. You know, there was that visible reminder that we are in the middle of a pandemic, that the severity of the pandemic has led one of the candidates, at least Senator Kamala Harris, to ask for a plexiglass divider. We were all given face masks on the way in that we had to wear. And those that were not wearing their face masks inside of that debate hall would be escorted out. So yeah. the severity of the pandemic which again has disproportionately affected black and brown people in the United States, um, that was hanging over the debate last night. And what we saw, uh, what was outlined was two different and stark visions for the future of the country. I think one of the biggest questions that was posed to the, pres the vice presidential candidates um, in this year of racial reckoning is whether or not they believe systemic racism is real and whether or not they believe it's rooted in American uh, history. I know that President Trump has been asked that, I know Vice President Joe Biden has been asked that. And last night we saw that again on the stage in the vice presidential debate. And it really came about, about a topic centered around Breonna Taylor. Um, and again, what you saw were two different answers to that question. Senator Kamala Harris said that her family deserves justice. And Vice President Mike Pence said, while his heart breaks for any innocent American life that is taken, uh, that he trusts the justice system. And he pushed back against this idea that there is systemic racism in policing. So I think right now Americans are being offered two stark and very uh, different visions for the future of the country that could be determined in this election. And we will know those results, results obviously in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I Just a little note here, you know, I started this year uh, fresh off of covering an impeachment trial for the president. Uh, I traveled crisscrossing the country on the campaign trail, living entirely out of my suitcase, <laughs> eating some really Really bad food along the way, the extra calories. Um, but I had no idea that all of that would be brought brought to a halt. You know, I had no idea that I would soon be on the front lines reporting on a pandemic. I had no idea that I would be reporting on communities that have been disproportionately affected by the virus. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that I would spend weeks on the front lines of protests for racial equality. You know, my, my role over the last year has really been unique. I've had the opportunity to talk to Americans who have been affected by all three of those crises, right? The economic crisis, the health crisis, the crisis over racial equality in this country. And then the rare opportunity to also be inside the White House where yeah. the president of the United States lives to be yeah. posing those questions directly to those who are in power. I just um, wanted to ask you actually, because you, yeah. you are in such a unique position. Like you said, you're on the ground, you're on the ground with the people, but yet you're in these rooms where you're able to bring those two conversations together. For you, what have you learned from being in both camps and where do you find is the, is the where is the most miscommunication? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's really, it's really tough. You know, when I was outside of the White House and there were, you know, at one point thousands of people marching uh, right to the president's front door and they were yelling and, 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 you know, wanting their voices to be heard. 
And what happened was is that the White House ended up putting a perimeter up around the White House. And in America, the White House is called the People's House. And so what that did is that divider, that perimeter pushed the people further away from the People's House. Well, what was meant to be a divider, right, ended up becoming this beautiful kind of portrait of, of um, the faces of, of lives that have been lost uh, due to police violence. You saw lots of photos there of Breonna Taylor, of George Floyd, of Ahmaud Arbery, of Trayvon Martin, I can go down the list, of Eric Garner, of Sandra Bland. Um, but there is the disconnect where people that were outside of the White House there on the streets did not feel like the president who was just a little bit of ways away over that divider, over across that gate inside of the Oval Office was not hearing their concerns, that he was not really addressing them. And I think some of that has come with a delayed response and reaction to some of these cases. Um, I think on the president's side, he wants to see, um, it, he wants to see it handled by the states and he doesn't want to get in the way, right, of, um, of, of the law, of the law and order that's being carried out in the courts. Um, but there is a sense of frustration of wanting the president of the United States and frankly, wanting other lawmakers to speak on it. And I would also say this, that it doesn't just stop at the thoughts and prayers, right? Um, I've talked to so many activists on the ground, so many protesters, and they have all said, the thoughts and prayers are enough that they wanna hear now about action. They wanna hear now about reform. And I think what came uh, from George Floyd was a discussion from both sides of the aisle in the United States. Republicans and Democrats came together and said, hey, we really do need police reform. But when it came down to it, they weren't able to get on the same page. And so at the end of the day, nothing did end up getting passed. And I think that is a part of a lot of the frustration for a lot of Americans right now. Yeah. Rachel, thank you. I mean, you being a correspondent, you know, when you think, oh, what question can I ask you? But you've covered all the bases. Um, but just want to ask you really real quick and just celebrate you because you being who you are in the positions that you're in and the rooms you're in is amazing. Um, and so thank you so much for your time tonight. Honestly, just to have your buzz and your vibe and your energy. Um, and my last question before I can see um, Rev Alvin Charlton jump on, what, um, what are the big issues that you think um, stop black people in the US from being represented in the democratic process? Well, I think one issue that is going to be very critical on the minds of a lot of Americans right now, especially during the pandemic, is mail-in voting. Uh, we have a lot of people that are going to be mailing in their votes. Um, and a lot of activists that I've been talking to are also looking out for voter suppression, right? Uh, we know that that has played a big part in the past uh, when it comes to communities of color getting their voices heard. But I do think for a lot of Black Americans, you know, those key issues of the economic crisis, the health crisis, the pandemic, racial tensions in our country, those are going to be the issues that they're going to be thinking of when they walk in to cast their ballot. Yeah. Just some of the Q&A from the young people who's got involved. Shouts to you young people who've locked in this evening. A question for you, Rachel. What definition do you give to systemic racism? Great question. Thank you. Yeah, this is so interesting because I think it varies uh, by who you talk to, right? Um, the, my idea of systemic racism, as it's been defined to me and by people that I've talked to, is the idea that uh, there are systems that were created in place to uh, disproportionately put black and brown people back. Um, and when you talk about a country that is founded upon oppression, right, that yeah. is founded upon the mass killings of native populations, when it's founded upon the enslavement of black people in this country, that has carried over, obviously, as we have seen into, um, into the civil rights movement when they were protesting for the right to vote, where a country that was created where people like me were identified as three fifths of a person. Um, that racism um, being being rooted in in all of in all of those oh I see Reverend Al <laughs> there um, but that would be the definition of systemic racism in my opinion amazing amazing Rachel thank you so much for your time and your gems and your advice honestly it's been a pleasure to catch up with you um all mm -hmm. the best really but stick around we definitely want to come back at some point to yeah keep the conversation going we'll do it we'll do Thank you so much, Rachel. And as I can see in the center of my screen, <laughs> the one and only Reverend Al Sharpton. Hello, sir, how are you? Oh, maybe your audio. Can you hear us? Somebody come clear, I'll, I'll come back to the radio. Fantastic. Hello, sir, how are you? 
got the microphone with me? Oh. What? Can you hear us now? Hello? Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Hi, Reverend Al Sharpton. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? How's the radio show going? Good. Very good. <laughs> we won't keep you. We want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us this evening. I know that you prepared uh, your keynote speech. So without further ado, it is a pleasure to welcome you. Civil rights activist, a legend who we look up to you. Reverend Al Sharpton, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you. And I'm very happy to be a part of this and having uh, been asked to do so. Uh, as we look at black history and we look at history of our people all over the world, we are constantly in a struggle for fairness and justice and equality. And we are particularly at a challenging time right now, both in the United States and Europe and in Africa. Look at the global struggle around advancing democracy, advancing our human and civil rights in the United States. We are in the middle of a presidential election where there are two roads, one that will go backwards, uh, in my opinion, uh, in back in the days of where only white males with money mattered, or those that have fought over the last half century from Dr. King days when I was a little kid to the others to, to now that want to continue this road toward what is just and fair for everyone, including Black people. You have the challenge there in England where we have had the same problems of, uh, of encounters with law enforcement, encounters with outright bigots, encounters with racists, uh, where we fit our communities in the middle of the storm around Brexit and how we survive. We see it in Africa, where we have continued to see the exploitation from some of the superpowers that want to control the land and use the natural resources to enrich their countries at the expense of our people on the ground. And even some countries where some of our own have rose to power and have not done fairly and have dealt in an autocratic way with the masses of the people after posing as revolutionary, they end up more revulsive. And all of that could cause dismay. But my Black history message to you today is that every step forward, you can always expect there will be those to push us back. And what we as a people globally around the world has taught the world is that if you are more determined than your oppressors, your exploiters, your slave masters, you can keep going forward no matter what. For every defeat, there's always been a victory. For every attempt to press us down, we found a way to get up anyhow. And if we really understand our history, we'd understand that the blood in our veins is not the veins and the blood of quitters, of losers, but of people that invented things and created things under the worst circumstances known in human history, yet we found a way to be creative anyway. Look at what we do in the arts. Imagine the musical and the theatrical contributions we made while we were enslaved, while we were oppressed, while we were at the bottom of the economy, yet they couldn't dim our spirits to be creative. That's who we are. We write great literature when we didn't even have the utility of light bulbs. And we could sit there and write great poetry and literature. That's who we are. We never had in centuries the comforts of others, yet we were able to express our genius anyhow. And what we need to do across this world, across the ocean, across the rivers and sea is recapture the self-concept and self-realization that we may have been enslaved, but we're not slaves. We are not, we may have been exploited, but we are not fodder. We are the people 
that in the worst of conditions made the best things happen. And since that is inherently who we are, then this generation must rise up and grab that mantle of greatness and say, yes, we are faced with some temporary challenges, but our forefathers faced worse and still made things happen. I sat last night and watched the debate between the vice presidential candidates for election in three weeks in the United States. And yes, people can have their opinions who won or who lost and whatever the case may be. That's not the point of my raising it. The point is, as I sat there and watched Senator Kamala Harris, a black woman from Oakland, California, on that stage as a vice presidential candidate of one of the two major parties in the United States. I thought about how when I was 18 years old, I was a youth coordinator for a black woman named Shirley Chisholm who ran for president of the United States. She was the first black woman to be elected to Congress. In 1972, that race was, and people said, Miss Chisholm was out of her mind. Who does she think she is? But me as one of them youngsters lived to see a black woman in the spirit of Shirley Chisholm is on the ticket and may be the vice president of the United States. I thought about how in my 20s, I was one of those that helped in the campaign of Reverend Jesse Jackson, who's a mentor of mine. Our mother brought me to him when I was a 12 year old boy preacher and he helped mentor me along with Reverend Dr. William Augustus Jones in my ministry and in social justice. And we went all over the country, run Jesse run in the 80s. He didn't make it, did well, but didn't make it. But some 25 years later, I sat on the stage as a guest as I watched a black man put his hand on the Bible named Barack Obama and was sworn in as president of the United States. I remember when I was in school and we'd march for free South Africa, free Mandela. And it seemed like we were just up against intraceable odds. But we marched anyhow. People marched all over the world. Huge march right there in London. But I also lived to see the day that I sat and talked at length with Nelson Mandela, not in a jail, but as he came to the United States to, to, uh, uh, to speak to the United Nations. And then in 1994, I was an election observer for the first free elections in South Africa. And Mandela went from prisoner to president. I raise all this to say I've seen too many victories to ever give up hope. Because if ever there was a people in the history of the world that snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat, that snatched hope out of the jaws of doubt is black people. We don't have the right to lose our hope because we've always taken the impossible and cut the IM off and made it possible anyway. No, it will not be easy. No, it will not be without effort and discipline and struggle. But Frederick Douglass once said that there is no progress without struggle. And you can't expect to have the great forest and the great gardens and the great flowers and plants if you're not willing to plant the seeds and nurture the ground. Don't get discouraged. Don't drop out, drop in. There are those in our community that says it's of no use. And when you drop out and say it's no use to participate, you're only conceding your life to others to make decisions. They're gonna make decisions whether you vote or participate or not. The question is whether you are willing to let others make decisions for you or whether you're gonna be part of that process yourself. The other part is we cannot become like those we fight. We are not violent, we're not beastly, we're not insensitive. We're not misogynistic. We don't require our women to walk behind us because we've had as many sheroes as we've had heroes. 
And any man that has to have a woman walk behind to affirm his manhood is not a man at all. You need people that can walk shoulder to shoulder sometime ahead of you to help us go in this direction. Yes, these are hard times. These are challenging times. But that's where our real heritage comes in. That's where our real knowledge of our history comes in. That's where our real belief in a God that always hears our cry if we be need in calling him. But God is not a valet. He's not going to come just to do it for us, but he will give us the power to do it if we stand up and seize the moment. And he will give us the energy and power we need. So our challenge, even in 2020, with a pandemic that has engulfed the world, where the rich and the poor are infested with a virus that no one saw coming, and it has exposed the inequality and health disparity all over the world because we now see in glaring picture how those of us that were the least are the ones getting the epidemic or the pandemic more than others because we had the world's health services and all. We in the midst of a pandemic still can see light in darkness because we come from a people that always sought the light, even in the darkest night. Just mm -hmm. about four and a half weeks ago, we had a march in Washington, D.C. around George Floyd and around Breonna Taylor and some of the victims of police murder in this country. It was in a pandemic. People said, Reverend, people are not going to come out. I said, tell them to come with their face masks and we'll take temperatures and all. They said, all right, maybe you get a few thousand. We got almost 200,000 people to come out, not one incident, no violence, not one arrest, because we stood on the ground that 57 years before Martin Luther King Jr. stood at that same spot and talked to a quarter million people who came with no pandemic and told them he had a dream, and a dream that we still hear 57 years later. What people don't realize is that day that they came to Washington, August 28, 1963, that is known all over the world as when King made the I Have a Dream speech. Most of those that came, came from the deep south. They had to ride back of buses to come, but they came anyhow. They couldn't stop and eat at a diner or restaurant. It was against the law to serve blacks until they got across the Mason-Dixie line, but they came anyhow. They had to relieve themselves in the woods because they couldn't use a public toilet, but they came anyhow. And because they came in 63, we came back four weeks ago, flying first class, staying in the best hotel and with big titles because they paid a price. And they did not pay a price for us to mock each other, for us to have violence against each other, for us to be calling our women out their name, they pay the price saying, if we squeeze the door open, just crack the door, our children and grandchildren will walk through that door. And yes, they will be challenged. And yes, they'll be treated unfair. And yes, they'll be discriminated. But if they realize in their veins is the blood of those that had enough strength to open these doors, they'll have enough strength to walk through and deliver and be as smart gifted and productive and disciplined and focused as anyone else. That's the Black folk story. We're not a story of servants. We're a story of people that rose and guided the world toward a more moral and sensitive way of governing, of relating to each other, of dealing with arts and literature, of dealing with theater, dealing in every area of life. Wherever they let us in, if it was athletics, we excel because we can't help it if we realize who we are and connect our mind and heart to our heritage and know that it's expected of us to do well. I started preaching as a kid. And I remember when I was four years old, I said, I want to preach. They let me preach in church, 900 people. By the time I was seven, I preached to a lot of people. And then when I was 12, joined the civil rights movement. 
A reporter asked me once I got known, said, well, why would you think you could preach in the Why would you believe you could lead marches at 12 years old? I'm reading press clippings, Wonder Boy preaching. Why would you believe that? I said, because nobody told me I could. My mother never told me you can't do that. My bishop never told me I couldn't do that. Stop letting people tell you what you can't do and speak in that spirit of your heritage of I can and I will and I must. So yes, in this moment, we are facing great challenges. That produces great leaders. Easy days don't produce great people. It is hard days that make the best of us rise to the occasion, cream rise to the top. This Black History celebration, you make your commitment you make your pledge, you, yes, make your vow to God that I'm going to be part of those that lift us up. Even though the weight is on our shoulders, we're going to stand anyhow because our forefathers did. I'm going to be the one that search through the darkness and find a light somewhere. I'm going to be the one to give hope to even my brethren, my relatives, my friends that have given up. And I'm the one that will bring hope to the table and say, we can't give up. We come too far to turn around now. So I say to my brothers and sisters in England and in Europe, that that's who we are. We've been separated by our waters, but the blood that binds us is thicker than the waters that divide us. Let's ride, let's ride, let's ride. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you thank you. so much. Oh, thank you so oh, much, you. Al Sharpton. Um, I just want to bring on your friend before you go, the one and only Lord Simon Woolley, who I know you guys get on really well with. Hello, Lord Willing. Hi, hi Swazi. Great to be on with my dear friend. I mean, this, is, this guy, this guy is the best orator out there today. No. Best in history. You know, we, we should stop the show now because we've just, we've just had a, a sermon, a passion. And to say this guy in front of me is my friend. How good is that, Swazi? I know. Well, let me tell you, there's no one I respect on the globe more than uh, Simon uh, Woodley, the Lord Simon Woodley. <laughs> I knew him before he was a Lord and he knew me before I got slim and trim. So we go way back. <laughs> No, it's it's great. It's great to be. It's great to be with you. And you know, we want you here in the UK sometime soon. I said to Swazi that when you come on stage, we've got to sing Happy Birthday to you. You know, you just oh, that's right. I just turned sixty-six. I'm still out here, and I'm almost as gray as Simon, <laughs> younger than you. We we got work. We got work to do. We want to see you. We want to see you in Parliament. We want to see you in the UK and in Europe. So once this lockdown's done. You better fly over because there are, there are tens of thousands of people. And when I say that this guy is the best orator of his generation, of out there today, that gives us hope. I mean, Swazi, I just watched you looking and listening to Reverend Shotton and your jaw just dropped. My That's what he does on a daily, on a daily basis. You, this guy gets up at five o'clock in the morning, goes to the gym, gives a two minute sermon, get on Instagram, and you will see him 5.30 in the morning. That's how we start today. You know, Every day. It's well, not thank you. God bless you. Go back already. I'm so glad you let me say hello to Lord Woolley. That's my friend. <laughs> Absolutely. My friend to the end. He, he's special to me. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank, you. thank, thank you, you so much. We'll see you very soon. Take care. Yes, you will. Yes, yes. you will. Take care. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. How was that? Well, you, you know, take care. Thank you. Bye. All right. I told you, didn't I? I told you this guy is the best orator of his generation. No notes, just talk to the camera, talk to the people. And you can see as he gets going that he brings out more of the backstory, more of the, more of the history. Uh, Dawn, I'm glad you brought Dawn in because- Yes, because please. And just a, not, not to cut you, sir, that I'd love for the panelists to jump in. So panelists, please join us. Uh, we're going to open the, the panel discussion, but Lord Woolley, sorry to cut you, but no, just want to welcome Dawn, everyone to come. Dawn knows, him, Dawn knows him very well too. And he's come to London and to support us in Parliament. I took him to Downing, I took him to Downing Street. They couldn't believe it. 
You know, this, when, when I, I was doing some stuff there, we brought him through those hallowed gates and in that door. And he walked into that place. I said, my house is your house. And he said, we own this house. <laughs> we own this house. <laughs> With all that, with all that knowledge and the, the the sincerity that only only a man of integrity and of vision uh, could. So, so I'm sure that your listeners just enjoyed that as much as I did. And I, I want to hand over to my sisters because you know this is a great foursome right here. Me and the three sisters. I'm I'm in heaven right now. <laughs> thank you so much do stick around if you have time um simon because you're yeah you're just so influential to have you to have reverend al sharpton i mean this panel alone is incredible but we're going to kick things off if you've just joined us welcome to my life my say my name is swazi this is a new space called quarantine question time to give expert advice to young people who are loving how to get into politics right now and um, so as you can see we've got the one and only dawn butler on the call hi dawn hey how you doing swazi Good, thank you. Good, good, good. We've got Marsha as well. Hi, Marsha. Hello, Swazi. Hi, hi, hi. I'm getting everyone in. We've got Mithoni as well. I think you're still on mute, though. We want to say hi to your gorgeous back. Hello, hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Doing great. Amazing. Fired up. Amazing. Um, I think as well, we do have Alexandra Wilson, but I think she's about to join um, very soon. But we will kick things off nonetheless. So um, Dawn, let me hand over to you, really. Dawn, you're just incredible, really, honestly, such an inspiration. But give us a little bit about your background, how you got into your role and what do you do? Thank you, uh, Swazi. And uh, it was great to listen to Reverend Al Sharpton, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. as Simon was saying, sort of all of that historical context, putting it all there for us to see that we stand on their shoulders. Yeah. You know, we stand on their shoulders. None of us will be here today if it wasn't for the pathway that they have created for us. And so, you know, that's what makes this moment in time, I think, so special because um, what we're seeing now, which we didn't see before, which, you know, Reverend Sharp didn't see then, is that there are generations of people now fighting for equality and justice. So, you know, you've got, you know, Reverend Al Sharpen's generation, you've got all of, all of us now, and then you've got you, Swazi, and then the younger generation. So there's a whole lot, so that's why this moment in time, I think is so different from the times when we were out on the streets marching, from the times when, you know, um, you know Simon and I were, you know, at the courts for, uh, you know, Stephen Lawrence, you know, trying to get people convicted. The difference is now is that we're not alone. You know, there's so many people of different ages, different colors, different class, all there saying, actually, this fight for justice isn't just about black people. Yeah. This fight for justice is about all of us. And actually, if one of us hasn't got justice, the rest of us haven't got justice. Absolutely. So we need to fight, we need to, for me, this Black History Month is about actually celebrating our allies, you know, making sure that we give our allies the strength and confidence to keep fighting. Because what's happened is people are saying to me now, you know, they're getting a little bit scared, they're getting a little bit worried because they feel like there's a, a backlash, you know, against the Black Lives uh, uh, movement. And it's like, well, actually, there's no struggle in history that has never been fought against. Yeah. Every single struggle for progress, somebody has tried to stop it. Mm. And so now is not the time to stop. Now is not the time to row back. Now is not the time to be quiet. Now is the time to shout as loud as you can and keep fighting because there's no way we can go backwards. We have to go forward. And, and I kind of say this, like politics is tough. And I know there's a lot of people now, and I'm really glad that like, there's, you know, this political movement and people are understanding the power of the vote, the power of their voice. Whereas before he's like, well, it's just me. I'm just one person. I'm not going to make a difference. I lost, I lost an election by four votes once. Every single vote makes a difference mm -hmm. and you know I went to America to support Stacey Abrahams and I've never seen such corruption in my life when it comes to that I couldn't believe it I was like what how is this how is this happening yeah. you know in America so 
you know, cannot underestimate what Trump is doing to, you know, taking away uh, post boxes, you know, 500 on post boxes that so people can't post their ballots. You know, we can never underestimate what people will go to, the lengths people would go to, to stop your voice being heard. So don't give them the excuse of not voting because there's enough people trying to stop you voting in the first place. So don't give them the excuse of not voting. Let them fight to try and stop you uh, raising your voice. But I tell you, our parliament now is more diverse. Labour is more diverse than any um, other party in parliament. But it's not been an easy journey. And people say, you know, we've got a, a lack of black men in parliament. Hurts me in many ways, trust me. So we have a lack of black men in parliament. And they say, um, why is there so many black women in parliament and not black men? And I have to say to people, look, the black women didn't get there because they gave us an easy ride. The black women got there because they put us in unwinnable seats. They put Marsha in an unwinnable seat. They thought Marsha wasn't going to win. So they put her in an unwinnable seat and Marsha won the unwinnable. Mm. And that is the difference. So oh. they, keep, they keep trying to hold us back, but we will continue to keep winning no matter what they do. They didn't put me in a seat thinking that I would win. They put me in a seat thinking that I would lose. Mm. So we will keep fighting back. So I think this is a this is a powerful Black History Month, although I'm not a fan of Black History Month per se, because I'm black all year round. So I kind of want black history to be celebrated all year round. So, you know, but this is a special Black History Month because this is 2020. This is the time when all of a sudden people are finally, finally, those people are finally getting a glimpse of what it's like to be black and to be judged and to be prejudged. And that's why I think this Black History Month is different. And that's why I think uh, we can never go back to how it was before. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Dawn forever putting fire in my belly, boy. We're not even <laughs> like, what, two minutes into the panel. Um, you mentioned Marsha. Let me come over to Marsha, really, to just, yeah, hear your voice um, and would love to know what has changed in British politics and what more needs to be done. But before I do, you know, so inspired by Reverend Al Sharpton, but also to say, to have yourself and Dawn, it inspires me. I've got black women to look to. Do you see what I mean? And that makes all of the difference for me when not only in your positions that you go in and do your job in, but when something pops off on the timeline, your voices are there. I'm like, what do these guys, you know, what is going on? And to have you so vocal and so present in the conversation for us young ones coming up, we're like, yes, yes to the doors, yes to the marshes. So I want to say thank you. Take this time because of course, Kamala Harris is a huge deal, but I've had you and I've had Dawn to be looking to for that voice. So thank you so, so much. Anyway, I will shut up now, but give it over to you, Marsha. Give us, oh. the, give us the spiel um, about black equality <laughs> and what more oh, needs to be done. Oh, thank you for such a wonderful in introduction. And you are also making waves in your sphere and in your space. So well done to you and keep up. That, that hard work because you're smashing it right now. So, so good for you. And can I just say, look, I was listening to the Reverend speak and I just said, I'm done. What more <laughs> can I say? I am done because this man just spoke what you can say he's filled with so much of the spirit, mm -hmm. but also he shares so much of his history and his journey. And, you know, we all can learn so much from what he is saying. But obviously as well, history teaches us that, that also. But you know what he was saying, you know, in life, they are gonna always, 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 when we step forward, they are going to try and push you back. But imagine how, we've, imagine if we just keep pressing forward and yeah. pressing on and not letting anybody hold us back. I mean, that's something for us all to hold on to. And can I just say what a pleasure it is to see my dear friend, Simon. Um, so I first met Simon, I have to share this story, sorry, I first met Simon, gosh, I'm not going to say how many years ago, because be, it will be showing my age, and I'm not prepared to do that, but <laughs> it was such a, a long time ago, and Simon was one of those key people that encouraged me and got, and um, you know, to get into politics all those years ago, and so, you know, he's been a huge supporter and cheerleader of mine, and so it's a pleasure to be here with you as well, Simon, and he continues to, I can pick up the phone and call him and ask him any advice and he he is always willing to be there and give it to me so very very fact much thanks to you Simon and and so forth but you know you're talking you want to talk a bit about you know has British politics changed 
Well, what can I say in the sense that, you know, there has been some progress, but more still needs to be done. And 2020 has shown us that exactly with the corona, coronavirus pandemic, but more importantly, the murder of, of George Floyd. But, you know, if we think in our political systems and our political structures, the first black MPs were elected 33 years ago. The late Bernie Grant, Paul Boateng and Diane Abbott, who was the first black woman to be elected to par parliament and she is still going strong today. But you know, you think back to their struggle and how they got elected, that came off of the back of the uprising and the race riots that took place across our country whether it was in Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, or London, that was what spurred them on to be able to, to stand for parliament and to be elected and still to be standing today aside, aside from Bernie. So when you think about our struggle here in the UK, there are so many similarities with that of, of the United States, which I can go into um, a bit later. But you know, Parliament still has a long way to go when it comes to representation. Because whilst there are only there are only a few black MPs now in the Labour Party, there, there, are, there are more than any other political party, but we have some political parties where they have no black representation at all. And when it comes to our elected councillors at a more local level, we know that only 1% of those are black. So there is still so much work to be done. But as we all know, it's not just within the political sphere that these changes need to come because we know that it is across the piece, whether it's in employment, whether it's education, or whether it's a criminal justice system. Today, we still have black workers with a degree earning 23% less than their white counterparts. Today, if you're a black or a mixed race child, you are still going to be three times more likely to be excluded from school. And we know within the criminal justice system, we are far too over overrepresented in that system and if you are black you are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched so structural racism is alive and kicking but we know it is a systemic problem that is absolutely going to require systemic solutions to achieve and overcome those and as i said covid has shone a light on some of those deep-rooted inequalities and also we saw the murder of george floyd this year that sparked a global uprising right here in the uk but because because for many of us, we had that shared experience and knowledge that that could have been our brother, our father, our son. And that whole movement and that whole trans, that whole movement and that whole series of events that have taken place since then has sparked us all to say, you know what, enough is enough. We right. need to demand that change. We need to demand action. And you know, Frederick Douglass says it, he was an abolitionist, a slave himself, but he said, power will concede nothing without a demand. And unless we stand together and fight for that demand and fight for that change, then nothing will happen. And that's why it's so good that now there are so many young people wanting to bring about that fight and demand that change. I think back to the civil rights movement, both in the UK, but also in the US, you think back to those days and you think about in, the, in 1963, we had the Bristol bus boycott, but then on the same day in America, you had that March on Washington where Martin Luther King gave that famous speech. Right here in the UK, we passed the first Race Relations Act. In America, they passed the Civil Rights Act. So we have a shared struggle. Our struggle will always be interchanged because the black experience of racism doesn't change. When I think about the racism that we all experience, earlier this year as a black woman, I was given a speech, but the media chose to, to misrepresent me and claim that I was Dawn Butler. And then another media outlet tried to call out that media outlet and mistake and again, mistook me for another black MP because the problem we face within our system is that they do not see us, no matter how qualified or celebrated we are, they just see us as one blob. But you know what, that's okay, we will continue to fight for our racial identity and we will continue to fight for that change. We will always come up against oppression and abuse. We see the online ab abuse that black politicians get daily. My friend and colleague Diane Abbott is one of the first people to be elected into the British Parliament, but yet she still endures the most abuse online 
but yeah. does that stop her? No, it keeps her spurring on. And that is my message to everybody. We have to keep fighting on because if we don't, we will allow them to win and we cannot allow that to happen. Mm. Marsha, you know I'm going to ask Mete for the carnival horn sound effects. I just need to get that because <laughs> I want to be saying, no, 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 no. Thank you so much for every word. We're coming back to you. We're coming back to you. The Q&A is going to be opening real soon, guys, if you've just joined the call. Um, I'm going to jump over to Mithonai real soon. But before I do, just want to say a massive welcome to Alexandra. Hi, sis. Hey, how are Hi. you? <laughs> really doing this in the background. So how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really good. Thank you. We're coming to you. We're doing introductions. So you've jumped in at a good time. Um, need to jump over to Muthona Kral from the National Political and Organising Directory Democratic National Committee. Yeah, you are. So thank you so much for giving us up your time. We already know how busy you are, given everything that's going on. So we want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. Fazi, thank you so much for having me um, and to all of the folks um, who have put this together. I'm going to think of Black History Month as the family reunion. Um, and, you know, I sort of think of this like the breast cancer slogan until there's a cure. So I'm with you, Dawn. We are absolutely Black 24-7, 365 days a year. But we had to have a starting point. We had to fight for this little old month. So, you know, we're going to hold it high until we are able to get everything that we should have integrated into the correct history of all of our countries all around the world. We are a connected people. Um, and I'm here to represent my chairman, Tom Perez, who is the first Hispanic chairman of the Democratic National Committee in the United States of America, a man whose parents are originally from the Dominican Republic, who Reverend Jesse Jackson Jr. will say, they just got dropped off the boat before we did. So we are indeed a connected people. Uh, and you know, this is a very serious election, but I am going to say this. This is happy post Kamala Harris day for us here uh, in the Democratic Party. And we are celebrating the incredible, incredible debate uh, that she had last night against Vice President Mike Pence, who um, at a certain point in time, for me, it just grew harder and harder uh, to listen to the lies uh, and the lack of responsibility uh, that this administration uh, is not taking for any of the things that we are suffering under here in the US. Um, as was pointed out earlier on, Black people are disproportionately impacted uh, by the coronavirus and by COVID. And you know, I'm married to a European man who, when he moved here, he basically said he has moved to a developing country. Why? Because it is unbelievable to him to see really the impact of what our lack of health care means for so many people. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have children that really and truly go to bed hungry at numbers that would just, just, just astonish you for a wealthy nation. So, you know, the stakes are high right now. And, you know, but, but what is so important about the strides that we have made. And when I am sitting here and listening to Dawn and Marsha uh, and, to, and to Lord Woolley, um, these folks didn't exist at a certain point in time. If we think that our lives feel like something right now, if we look at the things and the people that we lose, not only through gun violence, um, but again, through an entire system that when, as Marsha said, if they don't see us, if we're a blob to someone, you know, what that then means for your life and the life uh, treatment um, for so many of us. And, and I, I, I think it was Lord Willie who said earlier about, you know, just the, the potential that gets cut off. Forget like the basics of just, you know, surviving, but how do we thrive? We have a right to thrive. And we have that, often that path is cut cold off to so many people. Uh, and that is why I think as the people who are closest to the pain, um, it is so important that we are in the decision-making rooms, that we are at the decision-making tables. And frankly, I want us at the head. I want us to be running it. I want us staffing the tables. Uh, and so, you know, the story I want to tell is I am not an elected. I am someone who works to help get people elected, or I work for those elected officials. And like you, Swazi, I came into this as an activist. Most of us do. So many of our electeds started out 
in these streets, you know, <laughs> throwing something over probably because that's how you start mad uh, about something and wanting to fix something. Uh, and, you know, I feel that way too, but I have seen my way of doing this through a different path. And that is, um, you know, really helping to stand up the systems behind the folks who are out here and they are sort of our front facing people. And man, do they take a lot for that. There is a high cost to being the person who is out front. There's a high cost to your life, uh, to your livelihood. You know, they don't make a lot of money. Uh, and these are brilliant people who truly are doing a service, but they are also, they are, you know, some of the best because there's a lot of heart uh, that is obviously, I say this to a lot of folks who come and work for me, that this is hard work and it's heart work. Um, and there is something extremely fulfilling about that as well. So, you know, we are here, we are 26 days out from our election here in the US. Um, and I have some good news. Uh, despite all that you are seeing right now, and that stuff is true, the bad stuff is all true. But we have had over 5 million people show up to early vote right now. Um, we are at over half of our states voting right now. And, you know, that's why it's important when Senator Harris comes on and really holds this administration that we are up against to such surgical account. People are still making up their minds. And as they are making up their minds, they need to hear from these electeds uh, or these folks that are pursuing that next job firsthand. And debates are one of the biggest ways that we are able to do that. It is the larger stage in which we have more people's attention that are being pulled, people who are working two and three shifts here to make ends meet, but who took that time to be sitting in front of something, whether they were at work and they had their phone on and they were live streaming it. But there were so many people right now who are tuned in because our lives right now are truly at a decision-making point unlike any other. Um, and as we all sit here, my child just came home, so that might get loud, but you know, not from school, but from the little pod that I've put together of three children. And that is how we're trying to still do this homeschooling, although we're not calling it that because I don't actually teach him. There are teachers still doing their jobs out there. So, but he's learning from home uh, and still having a social life. But I mean, we're like all under this kind of like glass bubble right now, this glass dome uh, that this pandemic is trapping us in. And, you know, for those of us who can afford to have a, a bunch of choices, uh, we are the fortunate ones. But that is why I work so hard for people like Senator Harris and Joe Biden in a moment like this, when they are rolling out plans that when they get elected, we are going to finally see childcare moved to the forefront of our agenda. Thank you to the women who have been fighting and the men who have finally like stood beside us and not let this just be a women's issue. Because just like racism isn't just for black people to dismantle, sexism is the exact same formula for all forms of hatred, all forms of discrimination. That is a universal call to action and we all need to be in it. So, you know, we what we saw, in fact, when Senator Harris was picked by Vice President Biden as his running mate, online, the amount of disinformation and misinformation and sexism and racism having been the key two things that people are using against her shot up. And what I have heard from a sister in Silicon Valley who works for um, teaches at one of the universities out in California and is heavily involved in the tech sector is that there is money in racism and sexism online. That big tech makes money off of racism and sexism. So I think to Marsha's point and to Dawn's point earlier about like, you know, there's, there's just that additional dimension. And when we think about the fact that we have to keep fighting, but yes, you are always going to find someone who uh, doesn't want to see those advances. Well, there is a profit margin to suppression and oppression. There are people who have been kept out of the out of the marketplace. There is less competition. I mean, y'all brilliant. 
I wouldn't want to be up against Swazi for no job. <laughs> I can't do all that energy. I mean, you know, so it is easier to lessen the competition, shape the marketplace so that it fits you and your strengths. Yeah. Um, and so we are in a time now where we have made advances anyway, in spite of, and we will keep doing it because I'm not asking for permission for me to be able to live my full life. And I'm not running to some other magical country. Even Wakanda had to admit that they didn't need to be sitting there in a bubble somewhere. They needed to be opening up and figuring out how to create alliances and you share. We share this planet. We are going to all be sharing the costs of climate change together. And we want to have, it makes us more brilliant to have these partnerships, to be transatlantic people, to not sort of live in our village, but in fact, to grow our relationships. We become more knowledgeable and we are less susceptible to being hoodwinked by small-minded stuff, populist messages coming to us and making us feel like we need to close gates and shut it down and hold on to what we have. That stuff happens and we're more susceptible to it even for ourselves as, as people of color, when we are living in an isolated mind space. And the more that we are connecting with one another and building these kinds of uh, intentional partnerships, political partnerships, um, the better off we are. I love that you came to help out our sister Stacey Abrams and you are right. But you know, I think for my husband again, when he moved here, married a black wife, my, his whole world has just been blown open. I mean, literally completely changed from when he was a tourist coming from the Netherlands to visit the US. Completely different viewpoint for his family who is now part of my Facebook family. And they hear and see every day a very different version of the United States and they can connect it now with what they see on the news. And so the more that we are connecting and we know that Sister Kamala even is coming to us as a biracial woman. You know, when I saw the hashtags yesterday from the Asian American Pacific Islander community here in the US, it was beautiful. They called it hashtag, um, hashtag AAPI she rose, but it's like she rose and then she rose. Oh. And these women were all telling stories of their mothers who immigrated to the US and all of these incredible, powerful. So if you need something to just go and check out today on Twitter, it went viral. And uh, John Santos on my team was a part of helping to make that happen. It's incredible as an organizer when you don't even realize what you can help to do. And you take this tiny little idea you have and suddenly it's just, you know, it's you are literally lifting and people. <laughs> And then it's running and you're impacting people's lives. I mean, who doesn't need that type of lift right now? Yeah. Um, but also yeah. visibility. You want to talk about another community that often doesn't feel visible, um, not particularly in the countries where one comes from, but when they immigrate, it is difficult. Immigrant communities often feel invisible. And then when you are still even the kids of, and I say that my father being from Kenya, and so I know firsthand how that can how that experience uh, can can play out. So all of these things to say that we are in an incredibly important moment and these relationships that we have, this kind of call, I'm so grateful for it. We have to keep that going. Mm -hmm. um, Stacey Abrams became like an, a global figure and that is important. People need to, I mean, for goodness sake, for black women everywhere, for some black women in Australia, like for the sisters who are sitting there and they ain't got more than two or three people that look like them in a place, yeah. Yeah. you feel less lonely and you feel more empowered. Senator Harris, the generations of women and men that she is going to help feel differently about black and Asian women and sort of help telling that story, unpacking all of this, all of this constant, the visual, all of it matters. I'm just going to jump in actually because even as you speak about women that is so so important and to be able to tell so many different stories through your own I mean you're talking about the timeline but you know the tweet that's going to go viral after this is when you said it's hard work and heart work even I saw Lord Woolley like yeah 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 he's going to tweet that you know so you've got to get in there before him otherwise he's going to collect <laughs> collect all the retweets <laughs> Um, but talking about ladies, I need to jump over to Alexandra. Can I just say, 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 can I just
Oh, go. One second, one second, because I have to leave. I, I have my son, he's on from school. He hasn't eaten yet. And I better be a good father, do the right thing. You just want to play the Xbox. Don't worry. We know, no. your, we know your tricks. <laughs> hope for my son. Listen, this has been a wonderful evening. This has been, I think as uh, Mathani talked about it, it is a, a heartwarming evening. Mm. That sometimes we need, we need this space where we come together, we share. Uh, it becomes heartfelt. I'm only truly sorry that I, I can't wait to, to listen to Alexandra. Um, I think she's from South Woodford. I think we're local to, I think I, Alex, Alexandra. You're right, you're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw that you were Lord Simon Willie of Woodford and I was like, I didn't realize it was of Woodford. <laughs> you know, let me just tell you about that, about that. This, we, we live in the same area or she used to live in the same area. And Woodford used to be um, Winston Churchill's parliamentary constituency. The statue's still there. The statue still there. And so there's areas of it, a little posh, a little bit posh. Today, as we speak to all these posh people in Woodford, I'm their mayor. I'm their lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm their lord. I did think about, I did think about to some of the bigots. I would give them a cap. I would have a bag with some caps. Uh, you, won't, you might not know this, Mathania, but in back in the day, that if you were a little bit lower than the lord, you'd have to doff your cap. I thought about handing them out to, to some of these people, but but Alexandra, you are doing such great work, and your story has just exploded on the stage. I'm sure, I'm sure our sisters have had similar stories. Well, that Marsh has told you uh, about how their mistake uh, dawn for for uh, Marsha for dawn and dawn for Marsha, but your story is compelling too. And I think that when I see in the top right uh, uh, hand of my screen, I see I see Swazi, and on the bottom. The bottom right, I see you, and that succession planning for that young, dynamic generation to take the reins, to take the baton, and be you. You know what Mathani said, and and what and what uh, Reverend Sharpton has said uh, is, and I'll leave you with this: is that is that in 2020, in this special time, we have to own that leadership space, own it, uh, embrace it, and and run with it. So. Have a lovely evening. I'll watch the recording, by the way, Alexandra. Yeah. I'll be looking, I'll be listening to what you're saying and then tweeting it as if it was mine. That's what we do. <laughs> before you go, before you go, Lord Willie, I have to take this opportunity to say thank you for the nomination, but also to share with the panel and those watching, when George Floyd was murdered and I'm at work, I didn't know what to do. And the first person I called was you. I jumped on the call straight away because I said, I'm, I don't know where to go. I've got all of this to say. I don't know how to say it. I'm stuck. Can you help me? And you took your time about half an hour. I thought, what am I doing on the phone with Lord Woolley? But all of your advice and letting me follow those, those footsteps that you have led the way with. Um, well, we're family. We're family. We're family. You can call upon Dawn. You can call upon Marsha. You can call Cross Atlantic to Mathani. We're there for you. And now another young, bright leader, Alexandra. We're, we, we, we sew a golden thread, golden thread. Yeah, we're definitely exchanging numbers after Swazi. <laughs> with, with, see, with this, see them two, they, they, they'll be going clubbing by the way, Dawn. We're, you know, when it runs over, they'll be clubbing, swapping stories, drinking margaritas. Because um, I want to go clubbing too, so don't miss me out. <laughs> I'll, be at home. Story, us. I'll be at home with it, with it, my cup of hot chocolate going to bed at night. Listen, I, <laughs> I love you all, and I love Thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you. See you. Such a legend. Alexandra, we've got to come Hello. up with this. Uh, just as Lord Willie said, you, your story is blown up, has inspired so many of us. And um, we want to say thank you for coming on this evening. Thank you for your time. Um, and your talk or your sharing with us tonight about the barriers and how to overcome um, overcome them in the legal profession. So, sis, it's so good to have you us on the call. Um, welcome. Welcome to tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so I thought I'd start really by talking about what happened most recently, although I'm sure many people will have already seen because um, it has been all over the news. Um, so a few weeks, well, just over a week ago, I was mistaken uh, for being a defendant in court by three different um, court staff, well, three different professionals. One was a solicitor or barrister, um, one was the security guard, one was the court usher, no, sorry, the court clerk. And, um, you know, another member of the public told me that not to go in the courtroom because I was a journalist, um, which I'm not, I'm a lawyer. Um, but the point is, is not so much 
And the reason I laugh at that is because the point actually, and some of the news has missed this, um, and some some have captured this, is the point is not really about me being a lawyer. That's not really the point. The point is, is that the fact that it happens so often highlights the much bigger issue that black people are being over-criminalized. Um, the, the fact that I was assumed to be a defendant, you know, it doesn't matter whether I was a member of the public, frankly, or, or even if I was a defendant. The point is, is that the assumption was that I'm an, a defendant because people saw the color of my skin and they looked past, you know, obvious indicators that I was actually a lawyer. So I was in a black suit like everyone else. I had my laptop very visibly in my bag because I have a nice bag and my laptop doesn't fit in it. So, you know, my laptop sticks out the bag so everyone could see the laptop. Um, you know, I had black shoes. I was dressed completely smartly like everyone else. And yet I was the person that was constantly challenged. There were lots of other barristers and solicitors going in and out of the courtroom who were just not challenged at all. Um, and it, for me, it just highlighted the, the much bigger issue that actually on a, on a daily basis as black people, we have to justify our existence wherever we go because people are always gonna assume the worst of us. Um, and you know, it wasn't the first time that it happened to me. It was the first time it happened so much in one day, but it wasn't the first time it happened. And I know from speaking to so many other black barristers and solicitors and, you know, even judges and QCs, people who are the most senior in our profession, that this happens all the time. Um, and, you know, I, I might be the first person whose tweet picked up about it. I wouldn't even go as far as to say I was the first person who tweeted about it, because actually a good friend of mine highlighted that he tweeted about it about two years ago. Um, the, a very similar experience. So, you know, yes, my tweet picked up, but it's not really about my individual experience. It's more about what that indicates, you know, in society more generally. And that's kind of leads me on to what I wanted to talk about today, which is the overcriminalization of black people um, in society. I think one of the things that I try and draw attention to is that this is a systemic thing. It's not just a personal bias, which is what I think too many people mistake it for. You know, so many people say, you know, I'm not racist. I would never say, I would never call someone a racial slur. I would never, you know, not give someone a job just because they're black. And they, again, they're missing the point. That's not the point. The point is that we are living in a society where there is systemic racism and if you're not challenging that actively, you're contributing to that, you know, and I think all of us have a duty, not just black people, it falls on us all the time. I'm sorry, but it falls on us all the time. Um, actually, do you know what, like, everyone else needs to challenge it too. And it starts, you know, in my job, in the criminal justice system, it starts right from how black people are over-policed. We are massively over-policed. I know Dawn, I can see Dawn here, and you know, not that long ago, Dawn was stopped and searched. Um, and I've been stopped and, stopped and searched before when I was like 17, 18, I was like stopped in my car, quite similarly to Dawn to be fair, um, driving with my black boyfriend, stopped, officers surrounded my car, absolutely nothing there, nothing wrong, um, but it was terrifying, you know, I just popped like, I pretty like recently passed my test and I was absolutely terrified, I'd never been stopped with my white friends, none of my white friends have ever been stopped, um, and we see that in the statistics, you know, this isn't just anecdotal. You look at statistics of stops and stop and searches and there are 38 stop and searches per a thousand black people compared to just four per a thousand white people. That's almost 10 times as many. Mm. Like it's a huge, huge discrepancy. And so when on the ground, black people are being over policed, it's then unsurprising that, you know, the magistrates court, which incidentally was where I'd been mistaken to be a defendant and you know the first port of call for anyone going through the criminal justice system it's unsurprising that there are too many black people going through the magistrates court because if they're being over policed and overcharged then you're going to see more black people in the magistrates court and so you know then you you're, you're pushing people into a system you were literally forcing people into a system and then you know it, it, it that continues so even once you're in court black people are sentenced more harshly so black people are more likely to receive a custodial sentence than white people and that's the ministry of justice have published a report on that that again it's not anecdotal you know then you look at the proportion of black people in prison thinks about 12 percent are black that's not bame that's black and you look at the proportion of black people in, in you know society and it's like three percent 
So that's a huge, again, a huge discrepancy. And so all the way through, you know, from, from on the street being overly over policed, all the way through to being, you know, put in prison at much higher proportions than other races, we see like black people being disproportionately treated throughout our system. And then we wonder why black people are over-criminalized, you know, in the news, in, in their jobs, like me, just trying to go to work. Um, and so I think, you know, ultimately we can, we can look at the statistics and we can listen to the stories all day, but really what we need is change. Um, and I think my biggest thing is I really want to encourage people to start trying to make that change. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to now have a platform. Um, so I'll speak out, you know, as much as I can, as much as people will listen to me. Um, and, you know, along with that comes the abuse that I know a lot of other people have experienced. Again, I'm looking at Dawn because I know Dawn has experienced a lot of it. Um, and, you know, you get trolled all the time. Like, I, in the last few weeks, I've been called a chav. I've been told I look like a criminal. That's why I get treated like that. I've, I've been told I don't speak properly. I've been told that, you know, black people are criminals. And that's why, you know, that's why you get assumed to be a criminal. And that's why there are more black people in the system. And you do get those trolls. But for all of those trolls, there are people willing to listen. Yeah. And... I think that it's, it's a duty that I have to speak out about it and get people to listen. But I also think those people listening need to not just listen, they need to try and challenge it. You know, if they if they see that people are being over policed, like actually report that stuff. You know, don't just watch it happen. If you're in the legal system and you see someone being sentenced more harshly, do something about it. S like actually write things down, make formal complaints. You know, I made a formal complaint about my experience and the head of the court service is now in contact with me and has written me a letter in response. And it's only by speaking out and actually complaining and actually putting effort into to trying to change things that we're gonna see results. So yeah, that's hopefully a summary of all the work that I'm doing at the moment um, and kind of the things that I'm doing. And we yeah, have hopefully there's some questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Q&A is popping. I don't know if it's <laughs> coming through. Um, but thank you, Alexandra. Thank you so, so much. You know what's so amazing is that everyone does use their platform to share. And, and in those pockets, things are moving forward. And just to get the glimpse of what is happening, you know, to now be in contact with you, I'm like, yes, sis, fight that, you know what I mean? Pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, it's so encouraging to see when, when, and then everyone comes together. So I do like this, that, you know, it's like Christmas time when everyone just gathers together. So, and there's six of us, so we're good, we're good, we're good. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> open up for the Q&A now. And um, if you've got questions in Welcome to My Life, my say, my name is Swazi. We're gonna do a quick fire round. So I'm gonna have to ask our panelists to be good to me. Please be kind. I need answers to be at least within two minutes because there's a lot of questions that I want to get through um, and so first up I want to start off with one from the Q&A chat yes one from um, Thonai and then I'm coming to Dawn and Marsha for a joint collab question I'm liking these collab questions okay my first question is with the rise of white supremacist ideas and far-right ideology sorry ideologies what does the future of British and American politics look like thank you very much for your question yeah, fantastic question. Uh, it looks like um, whatever we help make it look like. So this is, um, we are lucky right now to continue to live in places where our votes uh, allow us to change who's in charge. And the thing that we have to continue to do as well is make sure that this is not getting normalized, that white supremacy is not somehow, um, and, and, and frankly, we have seen this under our administration here, it should be prosecuted. Uh, when you have hate crimes, there has to be a rise in terms of how serious this is being taken by law enforcement and by any other sort of um, mechanisms we have for holding people accountable to their words and their actions. And I'm sort of not trying to suggest that we should be filling jails um, over people exercising free speech. I am saying that there are societal norms in which people are going to have to um, say that this makes me, this, this is making people unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of this is violent language. It is language that is moving people to an action. It is calling people to take a, a certain type of action. Uh, and so here in the US, we just had the governor of Michigan, there was a plot by a white supremacist group to kidnap her. But that is where this can go. So please look at us as a warning 
for what happens if this is not taken more seriously. Domestic terrorism is absolutely real. These white hate groups are somehow uh, escaping the same levels of penalty and scrutiny mm. that people of color have certainly been put under and mm. uh, certainly with which other kinds of terrorism has been uh, you know, afforded way more resources. Uh, and I would say that that is the seriousness with which we all need to tackle this. Excellent answer. Thank you so much. So, so much. Um, one from Marsha and Dawn next. South goes out to Jasmine, who's looked in. Hi, Jasmine. Thank you so much for your question. Your question is this. Do we think positive, I can't even speak. Do we think positive discrimination tools such as quotas work or are they just another tick box exercise? Marsha, let me come to you first. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that question. And um, what I would firstly say is uh, no one should ever be in favor of any uh, tick box exercises. Uh, and that's the key because, you know, when you think about it in the context of race um, or even sex and gender or um, disability, it, it, it's not the way to do things because then actually we're not being genuine and authentic in the change that we are trying to bring about. Now, there, there has been some benefits and advantages to, to positive discrimination in certain areas because at the end of the day, that's how we create more, more equality. So for example, in the Labour Party, we introduced what were called all women shortlist, and that helped to increase the number of women that were elected to parliament. And I genuinely believe there is an absolute space and call to say that we need to have all black shortlists, for instance, to ensure that we can get more people that look like myself and Dawn elected into, into the British parliament. Now, quotas, can be a challenge in, in many respects. Um, but, I, but I can't say I'm against quotas, but I am against you know, people just being given a job or given an opportunity because they fit the bill. You understand? Somebody has to be the right person with the right experience and qualifications to do something. But we do need to look at things like you know, blind applications and so forth, because the bottom line here is conscious and unconscious bias exists. And that's just the fact. And it's how do we overcome some of those institutional and structural racial inequalities to ensure that we can create a more equal playing field. Yeah, thank you so much, Marsha. Great, mm. great advice, great tips as well. Um, Dawn, oh, you're on mute, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> so um, <laughs> we absolutely yeah. have to measure. We have to measure things, otherwise we, we don't know if everything's getting better or worse. So you have to have um, some kind of system of measuring. Um, I, I quite like um, affirmative action. Um, I quite like that sort of terminology. We don't have any laws like that in our country. Um, Marsha talked about um, all women shortlists. And because of that, that's why parliament has so many women initially. So that the all women shortlist had a huge change in 1997. And what was interesting with um, all women shortlist was that um, people said, oh, you know, women won't be able to do the job. Women can't be MPs, they can't be parliamentarians. And, and then, you know, women came in and basically changed the face of parliament and how legislation is made because women do approach things often very differently from men. And what it, what it actually did was it gave the opportunity to people to see that women can not only can be parliamentarians, but can be, are better than men. And I often say, like, we will know when we've reached true equality, when we have as many rubbish women as we have rubbish men in parliament. And once we, once we reach that, then we'll know we've reached true equality because there's a lot of men taking up space mm. that really um, shouldn't uh, be there. Um, so I think that in, in order to get systemic change in a system, you need more than quotas, because what happens if you have quotas is it then just becomes a tick box, right, we've got to a certain stage, tick, whereas it doesn't necessarily um, trickle into uh, systemic change. And what we need to is get a systemic change um, if we're going to tackle systemic racism in society. So, yeah. 
Great answer. Thank you so much. Oh, I get these questions going, you know. Um, Alexandra, I'm coming to you next. A question for you. Um, I don't know who's asked it. Like, I'll go back into the chat to find out who's asked it. But thank you for this question. Um, it says, how do we get rid of the subconsciousness barriers that we have, such as not fitting in or not being as good as our white counterparts in entering predominantly white professions like the bar? Great question. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, okay, so I think that ultimately there has to be better training for those of us already in the profession. I think at the moment, too much of our training is about equality and diversity and not about being anti-racist. You know, equality and diversity, frankly, should be a bare minimum. You know, equality is of course something we're seeking, but you know, that, that sort of training should have been done 20, 30 years ago. Like we're now at the stage where actually we need to be dismantling you know the more systemic the more systemic stuff and recognizing that so i think that there needs to be better training for everyone i also think um in terms of uh, so what were the examples you gave such as not fitting in or not being good enough i think also you know actually the the way that this sort of stuff is going to change is by there being greater diversity mm. um and that unfortunately does put a bit of an onus on us as black people um to enter these professions and to change things because if we don't then the the diversity is not going to change um and i completely understand why for example there will be black people who are there like why would i want to go to the bar you know why would i want to go and enter a, a profession where yeah. it's still very you know elite it's still very white it's still very middle class like why would i want to but it does require us to enter those professions in order for us to see change you know that that change is going to come because because more of us are there frankly you know once diversity starts to improve um there'll just be more of us you know it'll be a more it'll be a more comfortable space and unfortunately i i'm i don't believe that we'll get to that level of you know true equality unless we see the physical you know representation of you know each community like properly represented in each of those spaces i don't think that you can create this kind of utopian environment where there is just one black person mm -hmm. I, I personally don't believe that that can happen so it's it's one thing training people to to actually not have those biases but also you need to actually change the environment so that there are more black people um, mm -hmm. so that there's more of a balance yeah so as can i quickly say something on that as well just I just really want to say that um, like every year I kind of have a theme. This year, obviously, it's been thrown out because of coronavirus, but um, it was like embracing your awesomeness. And I think we have to remember that we've all been told that we have to be twice as good to get recognised. And so if we remember that, remember when you're walking in that room, you are already twice as good as everybody in that room. And I think it's just important that we remember that, we internalize that and we remember that every time we walk into a room, especially if it's a white dominated space, that the fact that you're in that room, you are already twice as good. Yeah, yeah. And even if I may jump over to, to that as well, when we walk into spaces, you know, our mind sometimes is taken up 80% of all of those questions that you're using to survey the room. How can I do this? You know, trying to small up yourself maybe, or trying to dilute. There are people who's not doing that and yet working not to that same capacity that you're working at. And so of course, when you come in, you're already working to a standard that may be above those around you. So yes to that, recognize and know that you're walking and you are awesome in that room. Um, yeah, I need that. I need more of that in my life for sure. Um, I've got 10 minutes and Mete is going nuts behind the screen. So I've got two more questions and then I need to wrap things up. So my first question is this. Can there be a special relationship between Black British people and African Americans? That's a great question. Thank you for, for answering that one in the Q&A. Um, Mathun, I'd love if I could get you that first. Can there be a special relationship between Black British people and African Americans? Well, you know, obviously, I believe the answer to be yes. Um, yes, and look, not enough of our kids are traveling. Um, and, you know, part of what my husband was uh, talking about his dream for our son already is that he's getting him a passport and then if he's of age, you know, backpack and he is sending him uh, to Europe. And so, you know, I think it is really important that we are um, figuring out the various ways for us to have these relationships in our movements uh, for anybody who's an activist and really trying to make sure that movements are connecting with one another. I know that, for instance, that 
<clears throat> that the Movement for Black Lives was doing a lot of um, intentional engagement with um, movement um, uh, allies in South Africa. And so I think in particular now we have like all of these resources that enable us to connect to one another. And so really carving out a space in your plans uh, mm -hmm. for those of you who are the activists who are, uh, or who are putting together coalitions. I loved um, what Lord Willie said earlier about you all coming, look, I am here to help host you if you're gonna come to the States for the Congressional <laughs> Black Caucus. We would talk to our, what we call them our CBC members and they would mm. absolutely welcome that. Um, yeah. The relationship is already there. It's just about the plane ticket and no mm. Corona. <laughs> Can I just come in on the back of that? Because I, you, you, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, the relationship has always been there. And I alluded to it earlier uh, in my opening in that, you know, we've, we've got those shared experiences of our fight for racial justice, but also the organising of what is going on right now today with, with Black Lives Matter. For example, you know, but for Corona, I know the likes of Dawn and myself would have been going over to, to the States to campaign in this upcoming election. Do you know, that relationship is, is already there. We just need to continue to harness it and continue to nurture that. You know, we've got all the tools at our disposal. I was in DC last year and I had the privilege of meeting with members from the CBC. And you know, there was already that relationship there because we have those shared values and the, the, shared, the shared fight for justice. So it's there, it's just continuing to harness it. And I would say not to, you know, we just have to also be quite bold in saying, you know what, I'm coming over, so can you host us? Do you know? That's just how we have to do it. Absolutely. And if ever you want to come here, then you know, this house is in your house, so it, go, it goes both ways. Exactly. And Marcia, as we know, black and bold go together. Yeah. <laughs> <You see> now. <laughs> Amen to that, sister. Amen to that. <laughs> I need to go to my last question. I'm sorry because we're running out of time, but this is a fantastic question to end on and just to absorb all of this goodness from tonight's conversation. Mm. You're all movers and shakers in this room or in this Zoom call. What are your hopes and fears for the future? In fact, let me not even go fears. Let's go hope. Love, love the fears. We don't do fears. <laughs> Trust me, fear for hope. Fear for yeah. what? Let's go. Okay, Alexandra, I need to go to you first. What are your hopes for the future, sis? I'm going to be honest, I hope to see a Black Prime Minister in my lifetime in the UK. That would be great. Mm. I really do think that it's about time the UK has one. So no pressure, Dawn, Dawn, Dawn and Marsha. No you pressure, know. Dawn. <laughs> nominate, I nominate Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> we're calling it, we're calling it. <laughs> oh. And look, I'm about to take my business. I'm like, I'll come and work for that. <laughs> we'll welcome you. Don, let me come to you actually, um, movers and shakers, an absolute joy to be on this call with you. What's your hopes for the future? Um, uh, I, I want to I ensure that the next generation, that they don't have the battles that we've had, mm. that we've kind of, we've broken down those doors, we've laid the pathways mm. and that, you know, you're, you're, you'll have battles, but not the ones we fought. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, why the hell are you fighting the same battles? Like, surely mm. we would make those change. But, um, but I'd also, um, I'd also just uh, want to quote some words, if I may, from um, John Lewis, um, you know, who, who sadly died in July this year, you know, civil rights activist. Mm. And, I, and I just, and I put some of his words together. And I think this for me sums up where I'm at at the moment. And he says, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. We used mm. to say that ours is not the struggle of one day, mm. one week, or one year. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, mm. or even many lifetimes. Mm. And every one of us, from every generation, must do our part. And if we believe in the change that we seek, then it's easy to commit to all we can. Never, mm. ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble 
necessary trouble yes. because the responsibility is ours alone to build a better <laughs> society and a more peaceful world so i say let's get into some good trouble and change the world yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i know if we were together the audience would be going nuts right now so yes get into good trouble good we're trouble. coming Good trouble with each other. That's good as well. That's, that's, that's the word for tonight. Let's get into some good, good trouble. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, Madonna, let me come to you as well. And then um, Marsha to close. But yes, for your hopes, for your futures, you're a mover, a shaker, someone that we're so happy to have on the call tonight. What are your hopes for the future? Um, my hope is that our lives are inalterably changed by our experience during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And during our experience where we had a movement rise up, even in the face of a health crisis, because that is how bad discrimination has mm -hmm. been for people's lives around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am hoping for um, the next steps and the next steps. And I love how many people that you have on this call. I hope they all see themselves as activists because who mm -hmm. gets on a call like this at this hour to do this with us, us folk here, mm -hmm if they're not already people who are ready mm. to take these next steps. So mm. I love it. And then my last hope, sis, is for those margaritas. I'm about it. <laughs> 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 While we are planning Marsha's presidential or prime ministerial <laughs> campaign. I don't know. Whatever it is, we're going to put it together. I'm ready. <laughs> you sound like some trouble to me, so. <laughs> and that's the end. Bring on the margaritas is all I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Marsha, you go, sis. You go. You take the floor. Oh, um, fantastic. You your hopes, yeah, as a mover, as a shaker. What's your, what's your plans? What's your hopes for the, for the future? Well, you know, honestly, I'm really hopeful for the generations, the, the generations coming behind us. And I say that because during this pandemic um, and the, 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 the global kind of movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, I represent a constituency in Southwest London that where your the U.S. Embassy is based. So the U.S. Embassy is in my constituency and being with thousands of young people there whether they were taking in the or we were standing in solidarity calling for and demanding for that change I am hopeful for that generation because they have said enough is enough mm -hmm. and change has to come and I am so hopeful for them you know people went before me they went before dawn so that we can stand on their shoulders and be the best that we can be do you understand? So for me, anybody that has any level of fear, I don't do fear, I do faith, but if you've got fear, I'm gonna tell you now, do it afraid. Simple, just do it afraid if that's where you're coming from. Smile at the future because you know what? We've seen what's gone on before us and we know that that future is gonna be greater before us. Wow, wow, wow. I don't even know how to follow up any of you guys. Thank you. That, from the bottom of my heart, like, uh, I'm full with joy. And I really think that we've done a full circle, a full 360, um, because Reverend Al Sharpton was talking about how we never lose hope. We've had too mm. many victories to lose any yeah. sense of hope. Yeah. And there's more victories to be coming. So um, mm. Dawn Butler, Marsha, Mathoni, and also Alexandra. Guy, thank you so, so much. Reverend Al Sharpton as well. Rachel, Mete, Jermaine. This has been My Life, My Sage, Quarantine Question Time, hosted by myself. Yeah. My name is Swazi, a Black History Month special. Everyone come together. Hey, hey, he's on the call as well. Um, this is a brilliant platform for young people to come together, to get the language and to get the inspiration from those who are already here, for you then to get new fire in your belly, for you to run your race and off you go. So tonight has been so incredible, a real, real treat to host all of you guys. Thank you so much. Huge, huge, huge. And well done to you, Swazi. Well done, Swazi. You're smashing it. Yes, yes thank you. Sis. Riding off the off the coattails for you guys, man. Thank you so much to everyone who's locked in. Young people, follow us on the socials at my life, my say. Stay plugged with the conversation. We'll see you very soon. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>